it sounds much more important uh, when somebody else reads it than when you write it. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a wonderful event. It's great to see everybody. And um, basically, the talk today, I will go a little bit uh, in depth into some of the practices and some of the approaches that my team has been using in Vodafone, particularly re around research and service design. I'll try not to make it too technical, but just for the, um, just for the sake of uh, knowing how to shape it, uh, I'm curious, uh, in the audience, um, how many people are service designers? Do we have any service designers? We have one. High five. OK. Um, how many people have worked with service design or have worked with service designers? OK. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit technical about the practice of service design, but it's going to be basically a little journey that we're going to go on together. And hopefully, you'll get um, something out of the practices that we're going through uh, in our team. So just very quickly in terms of my own experience, so I am currently at Vodafone. I used to work for the travel industry as well, so those challenges that you were mentioning are very familiar to me as well. Um, started in user research, service design for the past um, four years, and basically I've been helping teams to grow the function within businesses and growing uh, the way that research is conducted and service design that supports that. And I will start with an opening salvo, and we're going to revisit this at the end. And I'm also counting on the questions afterwards to maybe, um, if something is unclear, or if you think that that doesn't make sense, then I'm more than happy to actually go through it um, and answer any questions. So there's going to be three key messages to what I'm going to talk about. One is that process is not as important as mindset. It'll become clear what, what I'm referring to. Uh, two is that order is not the opposite of chaos. and Three, that extrinsic and intrinsic factors must be leveraged. So basically, what's in and without everybody who works on a specific project or a specific work stream should be leveraged to enrich that work stream. OK, so this is something that has been approached many times. And this is the perfect theme, really, because when we talk about innovation and seeing as though that's the entire theme of the conference, it's very difficult to actually try to define innovation because there are nuances about it. So picking up on what the UK Innovation Survey report uh, in 2021 defined as innovation, it basically had three or four, um, for a company to be considered innovative, it needed to have three or four the um, principles. So that it had to introduce a new significantly improved product or process, engagement in innovation projects, not yet complete, new and significantly improved forms of organization, investment activities in areas such as internal research and development. So this is what, the, what went out to companies, basically, to identify, do you, do you qualify yourselves, your company, as innovative? Are you having innovative practices? And basically, what this is about is about changing, changing the operation model, changing what, how you design things, how do you process that change internally. And there's always that um, aspect of tension within a business. How do we keep a stability of what we know versus how do we innovate and how do we change in a way that's positive for the business? And thinking back to what has happened over the past few years, for example, um, there have been many events that have actually prompted significant events. If you think back enough, for example, um, technology took massive leaps, for instance, for the First World War, the Second World War, and more recently, the pandemic was thought to be a good opportunity, really, for innovative thinking. We have a situation that affects everybody, basically, every country in the world. How do we contain it? How do we control it? How do we help the population? How do we help people? And it was seen as an opportunity to basically develop new hybrid ways of working. So working at home became a necessity. So how do we make that count? How do we actually make it into an experience that employees will look forward to? And how do we respect the health and mental health and physical health of the employees themselves? How do we keep productivity or even increase it at that point? And is R&D going to be the next big thing? Because we need to find solutions for the problems that the pandemic in particular is going to pose. Now, what has happened since then, and this is obviously uh, taken from uh, The Economist, 
which is based on a, a report by J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, is basically that we've seen a spike in um, GDP production and then a sharp turn in the last year. Same thing with productivity growth. It declined, obviously, at the beginning of, uh, of 2020. Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. Work was not exactly priority for a lot of people. Um, but then it was seen as we have this opportunity. People are going to work at home. They're, they have family lives and personal lives that they can actually um, they can leverage better. They can manage the, their productivity better. And there was a little bit of an increase. But then in 2022, again, a decrease that actually has gone down and dipped past the average before the pandemic. Now, there are contexts around this. There are economic situations, there are crises, obviously there's many aspects to it, but what we've seen so far hasn't really been a massive leap forward in any kind of real practice. So hybrid working is a little bit more common. So this kind of uh, flexibility is appreciated, but we haven't seen a massive spike or quite the contrary in terms of productivity or in that aspect in terms of the innovation as well. So this is from another report, more recent, um, where basically the activities were tracked, and this is taken again from the uh, innovation survey, on companies and their self-reported innovation activities. So as you can see, between um, the 2020 and 2021, and over the, the past 10 years, there hasn't been really a massive development, so it's always been around the innovation. The number of companies that are uh, actively identifying as innovative has actually remained relatively stable. And when you actually look into the activities that are considered uh, innovative, that the companies consider um, as a, an aspect of innovation, by and large, the ones that qualified as most prominent were computer hardware and software updates or migration of systems. And market research or acquisition of R&D trailed at the bottom. So they were the ones, the activities that the fewer companies actually answered as these are activities, these are uh, innovation activities that we are actually uh, involved with. And this is a, a, a bit of a mystery because we have a booming design uh, economy. We have more designers than we ever had. So we, even in the UK, um, the economy has blossomed for design. There's more revenue, there's more um, practitioners than ever, than ever before. So why aren't we addressing and developing solutions that actually increase the innovation and the best practices that these companies are going through, especially in the light of these uh, massive world events? I think that so the situation is complex and there's not one single answer for it. But definitely, um, there's aspects of change in design that are difficult to implement. And it's not going to be an easy journey to actually go through with a new idea, especially in the climate that we are in, and develop it in order to become a disruption factor um, without going through some real, real deep changes in how companies see research and how they use research and how they use service design as well. So <clears throat> part of it is because of the bias. We are naturally wired to work on what exists already. So severe disruption as in tossing the, wiping the slate clean, starting from scratch is difficult. For a company, it's a lot of risk. And it's not necessarily something that a company would, would want to engage in without a lot of context and a lot of um, aspects that would ensure the success of that. And that's one aspect that, for example, in terms of, for instance, service design and research. So I've been working in research for about 10 years. I've experienced companies that were flourishing, others that were not necessarily in the best of conditions. I've worked with service design teams that have worked in end-to-end -end new experiences that were going to be the next big thing, but also had projects that were very specifically about how do we optimize this existing feature. And what we've always seen is that within a business, there is an inertia sometimes that is difficult to overcome. And that's part of the reason why these kinds of processes sometimes steer towards optimization rather than true innovation. And the key 
thing that I would like to explore today is really how do we overcome that a little bit? How do we actually help the businesses understand and how do we work internally as agents of change, let's say? <clears throat> One thing is to really acknowledge the fact that sometimes solutionism is a symptom. So a lot of the times, for example, when my teams have been involved in um, a service design project, for instance, the innate, the first principle and the first objective is we need to develop something. We need to create something. We need to, as something has, have, has to be the output of this. We look at the existing process. So for example, let's say for instance that we're working on developing a new feature for um, a product for a mobile phone, let's say for, for instance a phone plan. And we want to provide people a different way of, for example, paying their bill. And the innate brief coming from the, the businesses, we need to change something about this. We've had bad re responses, or we had uh, some need to conform because of Ofcom regulations, for instance. So we need to develop something. And the conversation very rarely goes into, well, if this is not working for the customer, and we have it live, why don't we remove it? And then the customer will be happy. More often than not, that is a risky undertaking because, for one, it's uh, linked to legacy. It's linked to all kinds of aspects in the business that are not necessarily going to be um, followed. And so the, the innate kind of uh, attitude is, let's develop that. Let's actually work with what we have and let's change it, rather than necessarily, for instance, trying to identify the problem. And a lot of teams do this, a lot of teams um, effectively go into a problem and try to understand the problem, but they're already thinking of the solutions even before they finish understanding the problem. And this is something that, for instance, in research and service design, we're always trying to push this perspective. We need to understand the problem first. We can't do anything until we actually understand it. But realistically, businesses have bottom lines. They have objectives. They have quarters. They, they can't wait for the problem to be explored in all of its infinite kind of uh, dimensions. So what we need basically is to achieve a basic understanding. This is what are the, cur the current pain points. This is what we can improve on. Let's move forward. <clears throat> a part of that, and so part, especially in, in, in service design, one of the things that we do a lot is to um, look at how might we ease. So we start with an understanding of, um, or developing some kind of understanding in a work group. This is the problem. This is what we want to uh, resolve. How might we? actually resolve that. And one of the key issues there is that we try to be customer centric. We try to bring the customer and think of the people that are actually going to use it. But when we in the business are thinking, how might we um, increase the number of people who are going to use this? How might we develop this feature? Effectively, what we're saying is, what, how might we basically do something that is convenient for us, for the business, rather than necessarily asking, for the customer, how is this going to um, work out in the long term? And this is very, very um, delicate balance when you have these conversations. But it does happen. And this is something as well that reflects the, in, the internal bias towards trying to find something that is more for the business and rightly so, rather than necessarily for the customer 100%. So one of the things that we have to think about is that the customer is more powerful than ever. There's more competition than ever. There's more solutions. There's more things that are trying to get the customer's attention and limited resources like time and money. So how do we actually get um, to be successful in that? The key thing is really to try and look into how do we transfer power back to the customer? So the customer has the power of choice. How do we actually, as a business, how do we look into using that power of choice or trying to explore it so that we seem more attractive, so that we can actually compete with other possible choices that the businesses have. Um, and that's one of the elements that absolutely needs to be leveraged. And I'm happy that that was also one of the themes that was explored earlier. So confidence, trust, those qualities are absolutely vital for a business to resonate with customers. And in a certain way, um, predictability, because the more established the business is, the more inclined, in this, nah, depending on the industry, um, a customer will be to trust that the business will not 
necessarily do them, uh, do it on their hand or disappear or do something that isn't necessarily bad. Now, that doesn't apply to every company, and it depends a lot on the industry, but it really is about how do we, in the current climate, how do we ensure that people have um, all the information and all of the clarity that they need to make the best possible decisions that they can make. It is really what we're looking at in service design, is to try and getting the customer to have more power. So basically, we look at uh, different things when we work on a project. So we work at what the proposition experience is going to be. We look at what the channel touch points are going to be. So basically, that means you know, will we have um, web um, assisted? So basically, when somebody calls in, retail involved, and how all that comes together into one experience, and what are the customer needs and pain points? And really, what we're trying to get into is, and this is the innovation aspect that is critical, I think, in this, in this uh, moment in particular, is to try and have, be as human-centric as possible, be as closely related to the customer in their experience of not just the product, but also their lives, and understand that context, understand what is actually going on um, with them if, at that moment when they interact with the business. Now, there are many different frameworks, and I'm not going to go into every single one of these, but I will talk about one in particular just because it's the one that probably some of you have already um, had contact with, but also it's something that is um, inherently one of the key frameworks uh, used across the board. There are many different ways that teams can get together and try to expose solutions for for a business. So they can use Lean UX user experience. The design thinking is one of the, the key base um, frameworks for that kind of uh, approach. They, all, they can also just focus on the user experience from a principle level. So we need to have experiences that are um, beautiful and accessible and simple and intuitive and consistent. And all that plays a role. And all that definitely is part of good user experience. One thing, though, that we've grown to um, understand as well is that it's very easy to get lost. And it's very easy to basically lose track of what the process is supposed to mean, how does it actually get implemented, and what does it actually translate into. So sometimes teams just, because design thinking, for instance, was a, a big, I think it's fair to say, buzzword. Um, a few years ago, and every company needed to, needed to use design thinking. Design thinking is a new thing. We need to implement this across the, across the, the board. But what it actually means is that the teams, so the, the people who are working on the solutions, need to have better data to work with. They need to have more empowerment. They need to have more safe space for clearly communicating their ideas. And then they need to validate those ideas. They need to actually see, does this work or not? And whereas um, most companies worked in the business of, we'll have some workshops and we'll sort out some ideas and then we'll put them in the backlog and probably revisit them and maybe not, um, a lot of companies did use that as a way to promote new solutions. But there was always the risk that it was really just an approach that didn't quite change things dramatically or internally as much as, they, as it should. This is the mindset part, is that you cannot have true change without a mindset change in the company or in the team. And w that invariably leads to cultural change. So the, the company itself needs to reflect um, the values that would be used in this kind of approach. So I'm not going to bore too much with um, schematics, but you probably heard already of the double diamond. You know that this is, um, I see that some people probably are, were already expecting me to mention this. Um, it's probably the, one of the most popular um, approaches for service design uh, and uh, product development these days because it incorporates elements of design thinking. And basically, the, the point behind the double diamond is that um, you start with a problem and then you kind of unravel it and you explore it. So you, divergent thinking is used basically to come up with different solutions, possible solutions. And then you work with the team to define which solution or which solutions are going to be more, most likely useful or doable or interesting for the business. You design them, you test them, and then effectively you come out with a concept that hopefully you can deliver back 
to the readiness and delivery or whatever stakeholders are going to take it up from that point onwards. So this was the, the theoretical aspect of, um, of the double diamond. And basically what it entails is that you start with one problem and you do your work to arrive to the other end with a concept and a solution. And that's basically what it, what it specializes in. The problem is, and again, I'm, I'm happy that that was also a theme that was explored, is that it doesn't answer systemic problems. It doesn't answer big scale, hugely co complex, interconnected aspects of a problem. And design is really about simplifying. And if you look uh, at the Google results, if you, if you Google uh, Double Diamond, you'll find endless variations. Um, of it. So every team specialized it uh, basically to their own needs. There's different perspectives on it. But basically, when it comes down to it, it is a way to address a problem and resolve it. So one of the things, and two of the things actually, that uh, need to be um, held into account here is that this is part of the revised uh, Double Diamond that the Design Council uh, in the UK has actually published a few years ago. So first they came up with a double diamond, the FT framework, this is great. Uh, teams can take it up and start working with it. And then they presented the uh, revised version after a few years based on feedback because there's a lot more to it as well. So their revised version has design principles. So you don't just go through the phases, but you have to have some principles to it. And also you have a methods bank. Basically, you have some kind of library of methods that you use to get things going, activities for each one of these phases. This in itself uh, indicates that there's a lot more complexity towards solving a problem. But basically, it's still just a framework that addresses one problem, one solution, hopefully. And it's very, very difficult to actually scale up this kind of framework unless you're trying to um, work with infinite resources. So one of the things that definitely on my team we found was that there are multiple activities that we go through. I'm not going to go through all, all these, but basically for every stage there are things that we do. Uh, so we do tons of workshops with the stakeholders. We obviously interview the customer. We do surveys. We do all the primary research that we're supposed to do in order to build that understanding. And then we spend equally um, easily as much time working within the business with the stakeholders directly. What do they know? What are the expectations? What are the ideas that they have? One of the key reasons for that is because no customer-centric project can be just customer-centric in order to have that level of acceptance in a business that has some scale or complexity. You need to get people on your side. You need to get the stakeholders to understand the problem. And you cannot do that without actually making them an active part of that process. So really what we, the activities themselves, are not as relevant as the fact that we need to involve people in them. And so that's a lot of what um, we do and a lot of what we try to do is let's build this common understanding and this common vision together. Because that is when we build champions within the business. That's when we build actual change. So we've looked at frameworks. And basically, I said that there's a limit to how much they can actually work in the context of, um, of design. I promise I will try to be quick with this. And basically, in the stages that we go through, it should be said, there are some inclusivity issues. Because how do you actually scale up creativity? How do you scale up that kind of discovery process? Um, you can't get 30,000 people to work on one solution and each one of them having a different idea. And also, how do you sync it across that larger group? So for example, in this case, this is an example of uh, New Zealand's uh, report on service design implementation. And for service design implementation, for each one of the key phases, so discover, define, develop, deliver, so for these four phases, the vast majority of employees in one um, in, th in the country were, develop were developing the solution, not helping to discover or define it. So there's real inclusivity issues there. How do we actually get people together to that? So really, we're doing human-centered design we try to mitigate biases, but we can't really eliminate them completely. We need to work within those contexts. We need to try to understand within the business, how can we enact change and still include as many people as possible. 
And that's really the, the basis of this principle uh, that we see a lot for different products. So uh, how, many, how, many, how much time do I have? OK, just about it. OK, so just to close very, very quickly. So complex problems don't always um, attach themselves to uh, design, design uh, issues. So for example, if you look at Spotify, which has a company that has a huge uh, team of researchers and UX designers, and then you look at the actual change that they're enacting between, for example, the user interface in 2014 and how the user interface looks in 2022, um, there's not much change, really. So what are these teams doing? They're doing something, right? Effectively, there's tons of concepts. There's millions of different variations that were tested. It's just that these were still the ones that the customer responded better to. So they are the ones that made it through. So basically, the point is, the context is key to achieve a systemic change. We need to consider the elements that come into customer experience before and after. And what happens in those phases needs to frame what we provide the customers. And in terms of service design in particular, it's an activity that helps to understand those contexts. But end-to-end -end experiences cannot be designed in isolation. They need to understand that overall context. So basically, in terms of what we're doing uh, with my team is basically trying to incorporate more mindset change, more um, actual vision activities, rather than necessarily just following a process. Trying to build the culture, trying to build the relationships, rather than focusing just on a formal, a formal approach. And also keeping in mind that there has to be a strategy and a vision in place. We can work in the context of a small project and develop great change, but there has to be a wider vision. There has to be something that guides the business along. This can come from the customer, or it can be built internally, but it has to have exist. It can't just be working in isolation. This, these projects to be successful need to have that context. So basically, this is what the brand purpose uh, is in the, in the model that we use, is to try and align the context to what happens within the product development process, and this is where I believe real innovation comes from. So to go back to the beginning, uh, the process is not as important as the mindset because there's no true change without that development internally. Order is not the opposite of chaos because creativity plays a huge role and ambiguity is important. If you're in an ambiguous space and you don't know exactly what the problem solution is going to be, that's great because that's when true innovation happens. Because when you're short of all the answers, you're just going through the motions. And extrinsic and intrinsic uh, factors must be leveraged. People in the, within the business are important. Maybe not as important as the customer, but they are very important. And teams need to recognize that. And my assertion is that really systems thinking is the future direction of what we're doing in research and service design. And hopefully, that will be one of the ways that we're actually going to experience design in a much wider scale and bring together boring frameworks like I the one I presented but with much more uh, wider ambition and with much more of a worldwide change in mind. And hopefully that's where we're going. Continuous transformation, ambition, and bringing uh, the customer's needs to life as much as possible. And that's it from my part. Thank you.